Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Shane Kinney of the Drum Center of Portsmouth. Shane, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Thanks so much for having me. This is a, it's kind of a big deal. You're my favorite <laughs> podcast. Oh, thank you. This is the one I've been listening to, I, and, and you are just, you're just, you're doing so much for the industry, and, and we're so lucky to have uh, what you're doing. I appreciate that. Very, very fortunate. I and you're creating an archive, which is uh, what we need. Because, Thank you. Yeah, people Thank need you. to know and, about this. Well, ditto to you because I've never actually been to your shop, but it is just one of the most uh, well-respected drum shops that's done so. Yeah. From what I've seen, pictures and mm-hmm. just word of mouth in our community is so uh, huge. But it's so well-respected, yeah. so well put together. Um, Thank you. It's just incredible, which we'll talk about the shop more later. But we sure, sure. both know that people are here to learn about the drums of Nico McBrain. Yeah. I've always said Nico, so now I'm mm-hmm. fighting everything. I, I, it is Nico. <laughs> yeah, Shane yeah. has clarified. Yeah. Uh, it's a pert pert thing where yeah. I think so. Nico of Iron Maiden, um, legendary drummer, legendary just guy. He just seems like such a nice guy and a character, um, and we we all love him in the drum community. So. All right, Shane, why don't we hop in here first, and can you give us a little primer on who Nico is, you know, not a full biography sure, episode, sure. but his background and, you know, who yeah. he is and all that good stuff. So Nick, uh, Nico McBrain, he's the, obviously the drummer for Iron Maiden. I think if anybody's still watching, they already know that. But uh, yeah, uh, he, um, uh, you know, was playing professionally prior to joining that band for a number of years, but uh, most notably he was... Uh, with Pat Travers, uh, and uh, that actually will lead into his uh, first kit. But uh, he joined Iron Maiden in 1983 and uh, replaced Clive Burr, who played on the first three albums. Um, And so that was quite a big change for the band, as they're both very different drummers, both fantastic drummers. Um, But, um, yeah, so he joined in late 82, Hmm. So yeah, been with the band over forty years. Wow, it's interesting when that happens, where there's such a, a mega huge band, and I, I just equate Nico with Iron Maiden. Yeah, but I mean, Maiden had a different singer for a while. I yeah, mean, they've, they've had it, it's been it's been a you sort of at this point, so many years later, you just put it into a category of this is the band. Even Metallica just finishing all the Lars stuff with mm-hmm. Cliff on bass. It's like you forget he was on kind of the big the big first albums and uh, very similar with Maiden there, but, but uh, yeah, it, it, almost exactly. I mean, they started, you know, in the pubs and had a different singer and a different drummer and actually a different guitarist on the first album. But, uh, and what the real difference is how different of drummers Clive and Nico were. Clive is a very foundational drummer, fantastic hands, uh, incredible finesse. Um, but had a real uh, had a real solid uh, approach where uh, Nico is almost uh, like listening the audio version of an aerial view, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like yeah. very uh, octopus, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and 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 just swings hard, and uh, yeah, just very very dynamic. They're both great drummers, both great for the band, but yeah, um, yeah Nico brought it to to a different place. And you have done a lot of work putting this together. Obviously, he's one of your oh favorite God. drummers. That yes. goes without saying. <laughs> have you yeah. met him? Have you met him? Before? Oh yeah, several times. Okay. And actually, he had to help me with this. Wow. So awesome. he, yeah, Thank he gave Nico. me. Yeah, I had to get a lot of help. Uh, yeah, he's. Uh, I'm honored to to call him a friend and uh, just a. And and this is really the, one of the main reasons I'm doing this is because. A, somebody already did the Neil Peart episodes. And I'm so glad they did because I yeah. never could have done it as well as, as how he did it. Paul Wells. Oh, yeah. my God. Paul's the man. And the Lars one. Oh, my God. That, that guy, he was just Chris, yep. yeah, incredible. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I really wanted to, uh, you know, there's not a lot out there uh, of, of a, a database of Nico's gear. Yeah. And so – you know, this one, I want this to sort of be that living document that uh, is the the database of all of his kits because 
generations from now are going to want to know about this stuff. And that information may or may not be available, but it will be yes, here. Wes, well, th- yes, this is absolutely going to be that. And uh, on that note, so Shane sent me a huge folder full of pictures. I'm if you see if you're on YouTube and you see me looking down, I've got my screen yeah. down here uh, with his images that he shared and we're doing a screen share and uh, let us engage in some uh, some nerdery here and yeah. uh, kick things off. So let's start it off here and jump in with uh, our first folder that you've got uh, with his first kit and um, start off the gear of Nico McBrain. All right. You know, before we get fully rolling, I have to say thank you to Nico for helping me with this. Absolutely. We, we had an hour phone call uh, wow. to go over this. <laughs> and, and, and the other thing that I need to clarify before we really get rolling is that this is almost completely correct, but there are some holes uh, and some that we were able to button up and some that we, they're, it's questionable. So and I will point out where and when that happens, where that is and when it happens. Well, fortunately, there are uh, there will be experts in the comments. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Which is great because people will say, hey, no, actually, I think it is this. And right. then there were people who say, I think it's that. And then everyone can get a debate going and right. uh, it's all fun. And I, we, we always appreciate it. So on that note, please comment. Yes. Your experiences, if you've seen Maiden, if you've seen, if you've met Nico, all that good stuff, what your favorite kid is. We, yeah. we love hearing it. Yeah. And I also have to say thanks to uh, uh, Jim McCork, who's a good friend uh, of mine uh, and Nico. He actually does a lot of help. Uh, he helps Nico a lot with his gear. Cool. Jim and Jim knows more about uh, Nico's gear than Nico does. I mean, like he, he really That's is common. incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, and uh, the only guy I've ever met that has that same unbridled enthusiasm that for, for that for Iron Maiden <laughs> that I have. So, <laughs> yeah, just a great guy. And so thank you very much, That's awesome. Jim. Yeah. Cool. But, yeah, we can get right into it. Uh, the uh, kit number one is the uh, uh, – the one that I think people know a, a, a lot. This is the Sonophonic. This is a actual catalog kit. Um, I can bring up the uh, picture. This is the the model number of this is the XK ninety two twelve. Yeah, and is it enough toms? That's the, that well, is the question, right? Right. <laughs> and, and so this is a crazy large. Yeah, it's a sea of toms. Which actually, what he used for the rest of his career is it? Yeah. Is it these diameter? He actually went to square sizes, but this, these are all traditional size depth toms. And this was in the catalog. And he got this. This is he had two of these sets. And the first one he actually got. Um, this is a very funny story because he'd just gotten the gig with Pat Travers and he called Sonar and managed to get Horst Link, who was the owner of Sonar on the phone. And he had the, uh, the nerve to ask him, uh, to supply him a drum set for free. It, it, it worked. It, no, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> he said okay. that Horst says, I have one question. Does Rolls Royce give away their cars? <laughs> <laughs> because no. we're the Rolls Royce manufacturer of drugs. It's, wow. So but he asked, yeah. but he asked, so good for him. And, uh, he got, uh, wound up getting a wholesale deal though, because he was a touring professional at that point. And he said he paid about 600 quid, which, and I converted it, it was about $3,200 in today's money. So that was a yeah, significant it's a, investment. It's a big drum set though. Yeah. And again, for people online, we're looking at a beautiful sonar drum set with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mounted, Concert toms, one floor tom. Yeah, uh, the last concert tom is looking like it's floor tom size. There, I mean that's pretty huge. <laughs> yeah. And there's two bass drums, and he actually, you know, he removed one of the bass drums because he's never been a, a double bass drummer. So one yeah. of the bass drums, we don't know where that wound up. Okay, but he played that through his uh, years with Pat Travers, and then when he uh, the, the band returned from a tour uh, of the U.S. or Canada, I can't remember now. Uh, he got fired and Pat wound up keeping the kit. And so Pat's management actually bought him the same exact kit to replace it uh, after he was fired. So, wow. Okay. Yeah, he got the same kit. So, I, I guess that shows that he really loved the kit. Yeah. <laughs> he They're wanted cool. the same thing. And, you know, yeah. I, didn't, I don't know what brought him to Sonar. I meant to ask him that uh, because he was playing a George Heyman kit prior to that. 
His very first drum set was a sonar. Uh, but I imagine that it was the hardware that he was really drawn to. That's, yeah. That could be my only guess is that it was the hardware because, you know, at that time, they, this was the best, most sturdiest hardware. And obviously, they're great sounding drums. But, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, when you're playing out constantly, uh, you need to, to have something that's going to hold up. Yeah, it's the so, German engineering. And that yeah. is one that's obviously on my bucket list of doing a sonar episode. It's definitely, I've talked to the company. They sent me a book. COVID hit. We just, it, it, it'll happen someday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you might want to consider uh, having somebody like me involved in that too. <laughs> because well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a real, real nerd for sonar drums. Okay. So. We will absolutely do that. Yeah. That's good to know. But if you want to go over the specs of this particular kit. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, as, if you're seeing the picture, you know, it's we've got the you know sea of tom toms, but that that extra bass drum is is not not there. Yeah. Um, but the uh, that's the that's the catalog picture, um, and I'll bring up some other ones. But this is the the color they call this is metallic silver, and it's the beach shell. It's the phonic, um, which is a slightly thinner beach. But when I say thinner, I think it's. A, seven and a half millimeter if i'm not i might be incorrect there sure 24 by 14 inch bass drum all traditional sizes with the, the toms are six by five eight by five ten by six uh 12 by eight 13 by nine 14 by 10 15 by 12 16 by 14 and then 18 by 16 floor tom but he was using an lm402 ludwig okay at the time that was that was something that he used for many, many years. And that's the snare drum you're going to hear. This is the kit and snare drum that you hear on his first album, which is a peace of mind in 83. Um, and, and honestly, really, this is the, that, that's really the sound. If you really want an introduction to uh, Nico McBrain, that was, it was peace of mind. The where Eagles dare. The first track is yeah. that drum sound that playing. I mean, it's just, Hello, what an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> it's iconic. I mean, it really is. And it, it, but a big part of the sound, I think, was the, the Ludwig Silver Dot heads that he used. And when I listen to that album, that's still one of my favorite drum sounds he ever got was yeah. that very first piece of mine. In fact, that whole album, you know, just has such a nice analog. You know, this is 1983. Everything's analog. There's very few overdubs on guitars. Just a bunch of guys plugging in and sounding great. And, yeah. And so, yeah, that yeah. was just what an intro. They're all unbelievable musicians. Yeah. And Bruce's voice and everything yeah. is just kind of like, it. It's, it's as good as it gets. Yes. Yeah. And the concert times just provide such an immediacy yeah. of sound, especially in the traditional depths. Um, and so here's a little nugget that Nico told me, and I have not read anywhere else, is that uh, he told me that Steve, this is Steve Harris's favorite kit of okay. all this, of all the sets that, that he's had and recorded with. This was Steve's favorite sounding kit. Wow. Uh, and Steve is, of course, the bass player and band leader. Of, uh, and he, Steve Harris is Iron Maiden. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, yeah, he, he, he really loved the sound of this kit. And, and I, I could see why. I mean, it just had such an, like, like I mentioned, an immediacy of like, sure. sound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and then hardware symbol wise, it, when we look at the, cat the catalog picture, it's just kind of got two symbols, which almost looks like it has the ride and the crash kind of switched from what people, it's just a catalog picture. Right. You know? But what did Nico, because he has a lot more than that. Right. So I'm bringing up this other picture. Yeah. Now this is the flight of Icarus video, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I think I pulled this picture from the maiden fan site. There is a good thread there with, uh, you know, some documentation on his kits, which I, I actually uh, used a bit. But this is where things do get a little bit dicey symbol-wise because on the sheet that I provided, you'll see that I have the 1981 Peisty Profiles list, and some of these symbols are different. Um, so in 81, he was using some 2002s, um, but by the time we got to this, 
this picture that you're seeing, which is the Flight of Icarus video, uh, which is recorded in the studio. So it's this is what he recorded the album with. Hmm. He's using a, a rude crash up there to the left, which has been a constant in his setup. He's always had this one rude crash. Uh, but he's also got, uh, there's looks to be a 602 uh, up on there. But what's most notable is the 22-inch sound creation bell ride. So, you know, he was using two ride symbols for years. Um, and another in interesting piece of information that he gave me, uh, and I'm going to bring it up in this picture, and this is something that I have not read before. And if you see that picture now, you can see the sound creation bell ride clearly. Yeah. This was a gift from Clive Burr, who was the drummer he replaced. So good terms there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was so – they were obviously friends prior to uh, that. And, and Nico was friends with the band, and that really what led him to getting the job after Clive was let go. Um, but I, when he told me that, I was so – Stunned. I, I mean, I just didn't really consider to ask, hey, was this before or after he left the band? <laughs> like, when did he give you that right? So I yeah. don't know. Okay, yeah, that but, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but it came from Clive. So that was something mm. that, um, yeah, I, I did not know. Pretty cool. He's always got that very flat, the way he mounts his ride is like very Nico. You can see the profile of his drums, and, yeah. and it's just like, I, I, he he obviously loves it, but it would take some getting used to for me. I mean, it's it's very unique to him. Yeah, well, it, like in an er interview, uh, on more than occasion, sometimes you know people ask him, "How do you go to that tom and not hit that ride symbol?" And he's like, "Well, I do." <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I just I hit it. Yeah, yeah, sometimes sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and and I've actually sat at his kit and played it, uh, and it is as difficult. Uh, <laughs> as it looks. Uh, but when you, when I see him play it, it's absolutely fluid. Nothing seems out of place and seems to work just fine for him. Yeah. Um, so to each their own, you know, everybody's got their own way of setting it up and, and nobody sure. sets it up like him. I'll tell you that. that no, I've never yeah, seen it. <laughs> never seen anything like that. Yeah. But, uh, and he's Mr. Peisty. looks like we got a lot of 2002s yes. across the board. Yeah. And so and that the is formula 602, uh, the yeah. bell. He's got the bell. The bell he's got this, the, and that's something he just liked the way the bell looked, uh, and that's why he had it on the on the front. But yeah, he loved the six hundred twos. He was using a lot of those uh, with Pat Travers prior, but he found that you know when he got into Iron Maiden, he needed something a little more loud yeah. and durable. Uh, and so yeah, the two thousand twos and and Roods are. What, uh, and he had, it admittedly was playing a lot harder in this period, um, you know, because he's full of beans, he's young, and, and, you know, the band is just ready to go. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I'm no longer full of beans. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm out of beans. <laughs> um, Shaw sticks, you've got, I mean, again, your yeah. your list here of this, this spreadsheet you've sent is, you, you, you win, right, at this point of, yeah. of all the gear episodes of being the most... Uh, uh, put together, but what is Shaw Sticks? Shaw Sticks was a brand uh, from England. Uh, I believe they were from England. And that was one thing Nico said, well, you know, you probably know the history of them better than I do, babe. And I was like, no, I don't. And actually, yeah, heard of them. There's, yeah. there's so little online about it. So he was with them up until uh, he went to Vic Firth in the early 90s. So, yeah, he was using them for, for a number of years. Uh, hmm. But, you know, back there's different stick suppliers by region. So, you know, like in Europe, they're not going to usually the, – the big stick companies are like Vincent and now Meinl is making sticks. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, Vic and Promark and Vader are popular. But, it, you know, it, it was a regional thing, Sure. Uh, you know, prior to that. So, yeah, we haven't heard of them over here in the States, but over in Europe, they're probably much more well-known. Yeah, and he was using a Speed King. I don't know if I mentioned that, but that was something that um, he used a Speed King for almost ten years with Iron Maiden, and it's very uh, crazy because you know when you think about that pedal, you know, yeah, it was a fast pedal for the time, and, and when you hear Rare Eagle's Dare, it's like, yeah, that was done on a Speed King. It's <laughs> pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I kind of knew it, but I didn't know if it was a double bass pedal or something. But so Nico. 
does not do double bass. No, no. that's just so interesting because you think metal music, right? Got to do double bass. Right. But I mean, man, he can he can get those gallops going just yeah. with like through the the triplet kind of feel with the snare and the bell and it's yeah. Just, well, my, Iron Maiden, like they, they really were never, I don't think they ever considered themselves a heavy metal band. I mean, they were born out of, you know, Wishbone Ash, which is real, you know, bluesy and UFO and Thin Lizzy. They were just, they were hard rock that was hard sped rock. up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it had a, a, a lot of imagery, which I think evoked the heavy metal uh, characteristic, but, you know, they were really a hard rock band. Um, and, uh, but yeah. yeah, there were moments like where Eagles dare and it's like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty heavy. Yeah, uh, it really is. This might come up every, every kit. Do we know where this set is? I know you said the second bass drum is gone. Yes. Do you know where this one is? Yes. So there's actually, he's kept nearly all of the sets. Cool. Um, and this one was used to record. This one actually never played out live. This kit was used to record uh, Peace of Mind and Power Slave, and he later brought it back uh, for Fear of the Dark um, in 92. Um, okay. But by the time they went to tour, um, he went on to the next kit, which is the white sonophonic. And this is the set that he has, he doesn't have. Okay. And so what, what's there's a couple of cool things about this kit and that when you see the picture of it, what you really notice are the square size toms. What year is this? This is a, this would be 83. This is the peace of mind tour. Okay. And this is, you know, his four, first tour with the bands. And this is a gloss white sonar phonic plus. Pretty now, awesome. Pretty awesome. And so Clive Burr used white drums on the first, it, it, his light had a Ludwig kit and an atomic kit and they were white. So I imagine that, you know, Nico was just falling in line and let's have a white drum kit for the road. Soder did not offer square sized, square sized drums in the phonics series at the time. Uh, but in 1983, they introduced the phonic plus. This also happens to be 1983. So I don't know what uh, came first. Was it the Phonic Plus or Nico's request? So it's quite possible that Nico's request is what made this an actual production line for Sonar. Makes sense. Yeah, they had the Phonic and the traditional jet depths, and now these are the Phonic Plus in the square sizes. You know, looking at these pictures too, Unique setup with the ride kind of hanging over the tom, but because he's using single bass drum with these monster huge toms, it's interesting how it really wraps around him pretty closely. Yeah, uh, in a, in a unique way. Whereas if you had two bass drums, it could go more, you know, right horizontal in front of you, as opposed to it just it just wraps around him, which I think is it looks awesome. You know, this, I never considered that. Yeah, yeah, you make a good point because yeah, it really it it, it is it, it is a more condensed. The drum set looks huge, but I can tell you when you do sit behind it, it's not that big. It's it, tight. Yeah, it's very tight. And, and, yeah. it, and it was actually very difficult uh, when, when I was playing it to move around because it, it just, my arm is used to going certain lengths. And yeah, yeah this is a very specialized setup. And yeah, and everything is tight. But if you notice, he's using the two rides here. Yeah. And, and so one is a bell, specifically the bell ride, because, you know, he loves... You know, people weren't crash riding back then. You know, they were using the hi hat and then the ride, and 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 but they weren't really bashing out crash riding so much. So he he really uh, uh, used that bell uh, a lot. Still does. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, now Peisty makes a symbol that will work double duty. Does he? Would, <laughs> doesn't need two. Yeah. Two yeah. rides. Man, that this picture, that ride is. You'd think it'd be rattling on the rim of that. Tom, you know, it probably did. <laughs> I like his answer before yeah. it did. Yeah. I mean, it's like, but that's probably a part of the sound. Yeah. So he, you know, he does, uh, Nick owns a restaurant, uh, in Florida, rock and roll ribs. Yeah. Right. Be best ribs I've ever had. I'm not joking. There you go. Uh, but I've, I've been down there and I, and he has a, a concert, uh, every December 
uh, that and he actually has an Iron Maiden tribute act, <laughs> believe it or not. Because he's surrounded, he has some really fantastic musicians. Uh, one of his partners uh, at his restaurant, uh, Mitch, is a great guitar player and he has a great bandmate. So they, they do Maiden songs. So I, I've been down the past couple of years and I helped set up his kit. And everything is so tight that it really, yeah, I mean, some, the ride sometimes hits that, the rim of the drum, but it's close enough for rock and roll. Yeah, whatever. You know? Yeah. My question uh, is, how does that work in a studio? Yeah, exactly. You, know you can't I mean? have that rattly. Right. So rattly. I wonder if he, they bring it up a little higher. You know, I, I remember reading, it, when I record drums in the studio, I elevate everything a little bit more. Separation. To separate things, yeah. Yep. yep. So maybe that's what he does when he records. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great picture of real, you know, you see the 2002, you see the bell ride uh, and the room right there. And of course, we've got the little stuffed animal. Which animal? Is, yeah. It's, it's, he likes to uh, take the piss that way. He's a Muppet fan. Yeah, well, yeah, he's got a few different uh, ones that he's used. Yep. Um, over the years, and looks like a gong got added. Yeah. So it, there's uh, the picture I'm bringing up now. You might be able to see the gong. Uh, yeah, it's kind of back there. I think it's a forty. Let me get to the details on this one. Yep. Yeah, forty inch symphonic gong. He's using rude hi hats at this point. So obviously he needs the volume. 2002, 17, and 19 medium, and, um, and the 16-inch root on his left. And he's using color sounds on this kit, too, which is, let's see if I can bring up this other picture. Do we see the color sounds? We don't. So we're just, we're... What color were they? The, on the color sounds? Yeah. I remember seeing reds. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, he may have used a, a blue as well. Yeah. But again, the, this is another... This is another reason why we're doing this podcast. There's not a lot of pictures at this time, you know, of yeah. this kit. Yeah. You know, people, Mutter Drummer wasn't doing gear rundowns in 1983. No. You know, they were doing interviews, but we weren't getting a lot of real close up drummer gear picks. It takes a while to learn that people like gear. It took me 200 episodes to be like, oh, wait, people want to hear gear episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the, the real nerds, we just love this stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's the thing I, I can't get enough of is, Oh, what drum were you using when you did this, that, and the other, because I love the way that sounded. Yeah. 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 And that's also our, as, as drummers, that's our way of connecting with our heroes. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, Oh, they use this piece of gear. I'm going to use this piece of gear. And this is yeah. what's driven our industry. And that's why Pearl has so many signature model drums. You know exactly. I mean? yeah. And it's just interesting to hear about it because again, yeah. we're doing this, but I also like sitting there and watching other people at, you know, you sit there at night on the couch and you watch a video or whatever. And it's fun to hear about your hero and what they're using. Yeah. Um, I love the, uh, sonar ads and the one for the phonic plus that you included where there's, I believe a German gentleman balancing on top of a shell. Yes. Um, bring that up. Which that is, that's a funny ad. Yes. <laughs> like you just don't see that. Anymore. Right. Right. That guy's in a good mood. He's happy to like, yeah, I'll take a picture. He probably <laughs> yeah, works like, in the factory. Yeah. Now I'm Clyde Beachwood. And, and yeah, that's, yeah. The, the people always talk about how heavy sonar drums were and they're like, Oh, the shells were so thick. The real weight in sonar drums is the hardware. Yeah. It's, it's the lugs, it's the hoops. I mean, it's just such high quality that it weighs more. <laughs> and sure. so, and that's part of the sound too. So, yeah. Plus is, you know, the Phonic Plus is meant square size. And that was, you know, obviously Cl Clive was using cl square size drums. And that's when we see Nico go to square size drums. And I don't know if that was his idea or if the band requested that. Uh, because I know that he does like traditional sizes as well. Sure. So, um, but he's, but the whole world was kind of going to the power Tom yes, size. Yeah. So it sort of makes sense that yeah. this is what's in style. Yeah. But Nick was one of the guys who stayed there. Um, you know, oh, yeah. where a lot of people, they, they, you know, mix their sets up. Uh, I, you know, my friend Jason, many years ago, we were watching a, a video when I was working at the shop. It was an Iron Maiden video or something. And he had commented on, you know, Nico just, he knows exactly where he wants everything. 
Yeah. And that's admirable because every time yes. I sit to somebody else's kid, I'm like, this feels good. Yeah. Why does this feel better than my kid? It, <laughs> I know that feeling you know so I mean? well. Yes. And yet, you know, Nico knows exactly where everything he, he wants it to be. And that's admirable. So why, why mess yeah. with something if it works? Yes. I have drum set envy. Every time I sit yeah. on someone else's, I'm like, man, I like these flat cymbals. Yep. I never do that at home. Yeah. Yeah. Now you would think a guy like me who sat at more drum sets than you could possibly imagine. You would think that I would know exact. I no, I'm just like you. We're figuring it out. Yeah. I'm still, yeah. Give yeah. me another 30 years, maybe by that time. <laughs> yeah. <I'll know. laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, this is the kit that he sold. This is the one kit that, uh, he did sell and he regrets it. Well, that's a shame, but yeah, every drummer knows that feeling too. Yeah. I mean, maybe it'll turn, maybe it will return back to him someday. You know, Who knows? I don't think he needs it. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> as, as we're, we're all about to find out, there's a lot more drum sets. Before we move on, looks like on your list here, Superphonic, Speed King, yes. Ludwig Silver Dots. Yes. This, this was on the world peace tour. Same as the record. It was the LM402. Speed King, Silver Dots, Pisces Symbols, Shaw Sticks. Yep. Um, so yeah, it, it all it, all the these th this setup in terms of like drum sizes and stands are going to be relatively static for the next uh, several kits. Okay, and, and and then and then we uh, move over to um, yeah, there were some changes. Uh, late, later on, but the, on the next kit, we're going to see the drums are the only thing that's really different, possibly uh, some symbol changes, but we're going to go to my favorite kit uh, next, which is the uh, Concert Tom Phonic Plus kit. Cool. And this, this kit, uh, I can't remember if it's this one or the first set. He did it. He said he did a stock take at the Iron Maiden warehouse a few years ago and they're gold now. <laughs> they, you know, they've just discolored uh, over the years. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, this is Man, the, that's a cool ad. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, this is the set that uh, was on the Power Slave tour and on the Live After Death video, which is my holy grail of videos. And really, as a twelve-year-old, and I watched, I've watched it hundreds of times, maybe a thousand times. And this was really the video that just got me so obsessed with the bands and and i yeah. love the sound of this kit on the live after death album I, uh, they recorded that album in long beach arena with uh, the rolling stones mobile recording unit yeah 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 and i that, want to do an episode on that because there's should. so much history it's not drums specifically but i think it fits yeah well yeah. I, I have got a great ian pay story about that oh, cool. the cool. uh should I tell you that now or should we say yeah it for let's the episode? yeah we can take a little sidebar and well hear the ian pace. Uh, so I was in Switzerland. My wife and I were in Switzerland in 2017. I think it was 2017. We were visiting Piesty. And, uh, and so we had a great visit. And then we wound up having a few extra days for ourselves. And, hey, what do you want to do? Well, let's go to Montreux. Like, we're, in we're in Switzerland. We're going to Montreux. And I said, well, I'm going, if I'm going to Montreux, I'm staying at the Grand Hotel. That's, just, that, that's it. You know, we're Deep Purple recorded machine head. Yeah. We're using the Rolling Stones unit. Hmm. So we get to the hotel and I'm asking the people at the counter, I'm like, Hey, so where did Deep Purple record the album? And they're like, who? <laughs> they have no idea what, what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. And I'm one of those guys, as you could, as you probably figured out, if I really get into something, I really throw myself into it. Yeah. I get really granular. And I was canvassing this entire hotel trying to find, you know, I'm looking at the pictures that are online of, of the setups and I'm trying to build it all out. Like, where was it? I couldn't figure it out. But the one thing that I did notice at the hotel, the, in the dining room, the the drinking glasses were all purple. Interesting. So that was maybe a little nod. A little nod. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, perhaps wow. that one of the greatest, uh, you know, sounding, yeah. one of the greatest albums out ever yes. was recorded yes. in this basement. Well, anyway, fast forward to two weeks later. I get a call from Peisty. Shane, uh, Ian Pace cracked his china. Uh, we don't have this one in stock. Do you have it? I said, yes. 
great. He's playing in Boston tomorrow. Can you get it to him? I said, yes, I can. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I will do that. Yeah. And so I drive the symbol down, go to the gig, meet with him. Absolute prince of a human being. Just Hmm. such a nice guy. We sit down, have a beer. And I said, oh, you're never going to guess this. I was in Montreux last week, and I was staying at the Grand Hotel. So where did you record the record? I I was just trying to figure that out. He's like, it was in the basement. I was like, okay, great. Was it on the lakeside or was it on the bus station side? And he's like, well, it was in the basement. Because if you look at a picture of the Rolling Stones mobile unit, Mm -hmm. you see it parked outside the hotel. But the way through renovations over the years, I can't make it out. Like, is this actually in front of it or back of the hotel? I I couldn't figure that out. So I had an idea where they recorded, but I couldn't be sure. So I kind of just kept pressing in. I was like, well, it was over here. And and then he goes, it was a long time ago, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, did you go (laughs) left out of the stairs? That's what I said. It was a long time ago, mate. (laughs) He's never been back. Stop asking. Wow. No. Wow. Yeah, uh, but that was a real funny t- treat. And the producer of that album to tie it all together was Martin Birch, who's the one who produced all of the classic Iron Maiden albums. Ah, wow. Yeah. Okay. And so that's really the connection with the Rolling Stones mobile unit. Uh, they use that to record Live After Death. And that album just has this sound that is so analog and warm and it's really hard to, to describe how great the sound of that album is. Mm. The issue with it is that, you know, as you can see, they play 270 shows, and these are the last four shows of that tour. So the band sounds absolutely greased. I mean, they are just yeah. hitting on all cylinders, but Bruce is having a hard time on some songs because after 270 yeah. shows. Almost a year yeah, of your voice. constant. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So okay. it wasn't Bruce's finest moment, but you – you look past it and it's also just, you know, testimony to the integrity of the band where they didn't overdub the vocals in the studio somewhere. They're like, Nope, this is how we sound. Yeah. We want this out. So I, that was it. It's yeah. respect. It was definitely respectable. Yeah. Um, and so as a businessman, I, I really, I think one of the big appeals for me to the band, it, you know, music is obviously the biggest, but um, you know, I've modeled a lot of how I do in my in business to the way Iron Maiden runs their business. which Yeah, it, which is a business. It's absolutely a business. And they yeah, do everything yeah. right and with integrity, uh, and they don't compromise. And so No, uh, but was, Nico's also, he's smiling all the time. He's having fun. Well, I'd be smiling too if I had that gig. I mean, he's happy yeah. to be there. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a lot to be happy yeah, about. And I, but I think you get that impression that Nico would be smiling if he was playing in a pub somewhere too. You know? Yeah, just, absolutely. Loves, and just a nice guy. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more pictures of this kit. Yes, yeah, and and so this one, it, it really just uh, this kit. There are there are not enough pictures of it to be honest. But, yeah, you know this one. This reminds this reminds me of the live after death setup, and as you can see, the mics are just jammed right up into the toms. Yeah, which is really how they get that sound. And and the, with the silver dots, man, this just when he goes into the fill on opening fill on Power Slave on Live After Death, that is. Those toms, that's that's the kit to me. Yeah. I, I just I love this kit, and and uh, so here's one where it set up in in the studio. We get actually better look at the color sounds. Yeah, really hanging over there on that uh, tom still, even in the studio. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a great picture. Yeah. This was probably grabbed from Live After Death. Yeah. And as you can see, something that's interesting here is that. This actually might be from Two Minutes to Midnight video or Ace is High. Because if you notice something interesting here, he's not using an LM402. He's using a Pearl free-floating snare drum. Mm. And that was a gift that was it was given to him by Tico Torres uh, of Bon Jovi, yeah. their friends. Wow. And, and he had given that to him as a gift. And he used that on this a couple of their videos. Um but to my knowledge, I, I, I don't think he ever used this live. It was, he always used the 402. More of a, hey, thanks for the snare. And it looks cool. You know, why not put it in the video? Kind of. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know why he chose to use that. I don't know if he know, remembers either. But 
Yeah. Uh, it, it's right. always a, a definitely a conversation starter because, yeah. you know, I've never seen him use a piece of pearl, anything. So, mm. um, yeah, but we've got the same silver dot heads, speed King pedal. And for the tour, he's got that, that LM402. Uh, let me bring up this other picture here. Do you think it was ever a conflict with sonar about using that Ludwig snare all the time or did they care or it is what it is kind of thing? I don't think so because, you know, again, back then there was no internet. They didn't, you know, who's sure. going to see, uh, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. from the fifth row, Hey, that doesn't look like a sonar lug on the snare drum. It wasn't as big of a deal back then. But yeah. Yeah. Endorsements started to get pretty serious. Like right after that, when a lot of the Japanese companies, because, with some of the, at the time, the Japanese companies were paying some money yeah. to the artists, and then it was okay. You have to use this when you play out. Sure. But back then, I don't think it was as big of a deal. Um, and Sonar had a great sounding ferromanganese snare drum, but he just loved this 402, and he bought this LM 402 of Manny's Music in 1975. Hmm. And he said he paid 90 bucks for it. And that's one thing I always mention about the importance of buying things from a drum store. So if there's a little shameless plug for what I do, if you ever ask a drummer, and you probably know this part, when you talk to a drummer and you ask them about a piece of gear, they always say, they always tell you where they bought it and how much they paid for it. Yeah. Always. Oh, I got it here. I got this story. at Manny's Music and I, I paid 90 90 bucks for it. He said, I can't remember the name of the guy I bought it from. Like, well, that was 50 years ago. So yeah, I, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. But that, you don't usually say, Oh, I got it online at this retail. I got no, it from no. musician's friend or whatever years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It takes it, a lot of the, the magic, it, it, you know, buying a musical instrument is an emotional experience. Yes. And walking into a drum shop and experiencing that is, you know, it's something you never forget. But you know when you when you order it online, it, it uh, which is fine too. But when it's not quite the same. It's, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. But That's a good point. Bring up another picture here. That's a great picture. Yeah. This is this has his twenty two inch Sound Creation China, the dark China on there, hmm. and what appears to be a slightly smaller gong, but that might be perspective because it, in the list it says he has a forty inch gong. I, and that just might be the, an, the angle of the lens. I'm not quite sure. And there's a picture with, without the without the ad. Yeah, and in this photo, it's interesting too. Uh, the one you have pulled up about it looks like there's, you know, you have the felt strip going across the top, mm -hmm. bass drum head. It appears to be cut kind of in a. Uh, how do you describe it? I would describe it almost as like a toilet seat shape. <laughs> Slack jaw, open mouth. <laughs> Slack, like an open mouth, yeah. flat across the top, yeah. goes open down the bottom, and then blanket inside, which is how we all, I mean, I throw a blanket or a sweatshirt or a yep. pillow in there, but it's interesting that, you know, on a sonar ad, it's just like, got yep. the blanket in there. Yep. This is this is set up. It's, it's obviously being set up for a gig, and might as well take the picture then and there, and this is how yeah. the drums are used. And yeah, this is before companies learned to market a pillow and, and, and sell a pillow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for $90 yeah. or something. We were using our snuggable blankets and throwing them in there. And this is before pre-muffled drum heads too, you know, before power stroke style heads. So yep. he's using a silver dot head, which is, you know, going to emit a higher pitch. And, you know, the blanket is going to give you that, that oomph. Yeah, the, the oomph you want. Yeah. Yeah, and twenty-four. The sizes of this kit, which I, I suppose, suppose should go through, they yep. are all square except for the six. Should be a six by eight, uh, okay. a six inch. Uh, that's eight inches deep. Although it may be six by six because there's no bottom lugs on it. Um, that, because if it was an eight, they'd have more room to fit the lugs to. Right, but there's because it's concert time. Yeah, they don't have they that problem. It might be six by six. Uh, okay. But yeah, all the toms are square. The floor tom is 19 inches deep. It's 18 by 19. Gotcha. Uh, and 24 that, uh, by 18 inch kick. So yeah, this is the, again, that's the, that's the kit. For, for most people, when you talk to most Iron Maiden fans that are around my age, it's like that. this is the kit they talk about. Yeah, this is the one. Back in metallic silver. So back to his original color. Yes, right? yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, they didn't offer a lot of different color options back then. And so, 
yeah, your silver, your whites, your blacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the industry's come a long way. Yeah, for sure. And so speaking of the industry coming a long way, this will bring us to the next kit, which is the other kit when people talk about his famous drum sets. Uh, it's the Somewhere in Time kit. Yeah, and unbelievable. This is the one that uh, I'll bring up the ad. This is this ad is just timeless. Yeah. I, I look how beautiful that kit is. It's so cool, yeah. Yeah. So if, if for the people that are listening to this, if, this is the high tech uh, sonar phonic kit, which is gray with black hardware and the stands are black, the lugs are black. And, and so this is 1986. And, and so it, it's important to note that no drum company was marketing colored hardware at this time. This was really unheard of. I mean, we take this for granted now. Drum companies offer custom shop this, gold hardware, yada, yada, yada. Back then, this was not uh, not a really thing. a thing. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so this was the Somewhere in Time album, which had a real futuristic vibe. And the uh, bring up the album cover. If you see, this, this is the album cover, which is... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is so in depth, futuristic. Uh, this had this incredible, uh, you know, just this looks like Times Square meets Shibuya Crossing. I mean, it's really just yeah, yeah. it's um, kind of has a Blade Runner feel yeah. to it. Yeah, uh, and and they're from seeing some other pictures here. They're clearly the stages are getting bigger. Yes. Everything's getting more. It's all a part of the show. Yes. So the drums, it looks so cool with the little, uh, what would they be called? The little gasket or whatever under the yeah, lug. Yeah, the, the lug gaskets. Is white on black. I've never seen that before and it has such a cool effect. Yes. And, and so here's a modern picture of it. When he returned to Sonar in 2016, they brought this kid out back out and here's a great picture of what it looks like at present day. This is set up at, uh, at NAM, I believe, or it's at his, no, this is actually at his shop. He has a, he has a partner, uh, Craig in a drum shop, uh, in Manchester, UK. Yeah. And this drum is one, drum one. Right? Yes. Yep. Um, but you know, in, it, imagine looking at this kit in 1986. I, I mean, it's just, it, it was so futuristic. And so, it, you know, he went to Carl Heinz Menzel uh, at Sonar. And Carl Heinz recently retired, uh, but Carl worked at Sonar for decades. And just, he, Carl was Sonar, really. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah. And he went to Carl and said, you know, we've got this real futuristic album somewhere in time coming up, and I want a kit to accommodate that. And so I can just envision Carl Heinz going, futuristic, huh? Well, Hold my Hefeweizen. <laughs> yeah. Hold my, I was going to say, hold my sausage. Yeah, hold, sounds, my, yeah, hold my bratwurst. Yeah. yeah, that's not good. Um, no. <laughs> and so Carl built this kit. He, he, he just designed and built this kit. And keep in mind, this, this is back when, when Sonar was handling all the chrome plating in-house and in Germany. And so they, you know, have a triple bath to chrome plate, nickel, copper, and then chrome. And so they actually had to move one of the vats out to do the black plating. Hmm. Uh, and he was able to turn this around and it looks so good yeah. that they, this also became part of Sonar's drum program and the phonic, it was called the phonic plus high tech. Wow. Uh, so Nico's like, but that's how it should be where we've got our, our, would you call him their guy at that point in time of like, I mean, they, I'm sure they had other players playing yeah. other genres, but he's got to be one of their main endorsers. Yes, and I, he gave them more visibility than any, uh, I mean, arguably Phil Rudd uh, of ACDC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, he really, but you know, ACDC did not play the amount of gigs that Iron Maiden did. So yeah. I would say that Nico definitely gave more gross impressions of that logo than, than any yeah. drummer uh, ever has, honestly. Yeah, um, but that's cool that he's kind of their R&D you know, let's take it out on the road. Oh, people are loving this. They get the calls, yeah. the Ringo effect of, I want that. Yeah. And 
then they offer it. Well, it's funny though. He's never taken credit for that. Nobody's ever given him credit for it either. <laughs> and it might just be circumstance really. But I mean, it just seems interesting that the, yeah. the phonic plus high tech and then now it, 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 before the, uh, the phonic plus being born out of his, his needs or the, or the band's needs. So yeah, very, we're giving, very cool. We're giving him credit right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. <laughs> This kid was on loan for some time and, and uh, he got it back when, when, when he returned to Sonar. Because when he went back to Sonar, they needed to make him a kit. It wasn't ready yet. Nam was right around the corner. They're like, well, why don't we bring out your somewhere in time kit and display that? So Yeah. And that has the more modern Pisces that are like his signature with the yes, this is Pisces a, yeah. maiden font. Yes. This is not a period correct picture because that yeah. was from 2016. Sure. Sure. And, there, and there's another one with... <clears throat> the more modern, uh, but I do have this picture. Now this is going to stir up some real controversy because this picture is taken at Compass Point Studios. Nico seems to believe he seems to remember using his first phonic kit recording somewhere in time, the concert time kit. The yep. XK9212. Well, we have evidence here that this is the, we're in Compass Point Studios in the Bahamas with the Somewhere in Time kit. So, and if you look at that six inch Tom, it's got a chrome hoop. If you notice that in the pictures. Yeah, it's not black. It's not black. And, and the has, other ones yeah, are. Yeah, the other ones are, are black, but this black. one, that hoop wasn't ready yet. And they use that kit uh, for the recording. And I can tell you that as a fan, and I listened to Somewhere in Time again yesterday, that is definitely this kit. There's no question about it. It's not the Concert Tom kit on that album. Gotcha. It just, it, it's, it's without, without doubt. And that, that was the album where, you know, everything, this was just a quantum leap in his gear and really a quantum leap in his playing, if you ask. It, to me, the, the, his playing on Cox Over in Time is his high water mark. I mean, mm -hmm. it really just, I mean, the band, if you consider over the past three or four years, how many gigs they played, these guys were so greased. It just, everything was so fluid and easy to them. His footwork on Cox Over in Time is just stupefying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really a quantum leap for Sonar too, because you know, this was now they were they were doing something no other drum companies were. And then he's got, you know, Pisces and he's got a couple of color sets. No, actually he doesn't. No, no color, color no, no sounds. color sounds on that. On the on the recording. Right, right. Exactly not on the recording. Yeah. But he's using some of the three thousand series symbols and he's got some a mix of sound creation and rude. So he was definitely there was some cross pollination there going on with his bronze. Yeah, uh, which is you know okay, but he's got chrome stands in the studio here too, because the black ones were not ready. Sure. Well, it's a studio. Who cares? Right. You know, no one's seen it. It's not important. Right. That's another picture here of in the studio, just to drive the point home that this was definitely the kit that he used to record. Oh some yeah, time. that's a good picture. Yeah. I mean, there's. It happens. It's, it was a long time ago, so yeah. it's easy to kind of mix things up. And to the point that, or question that I was bringing up earlier, it looks like his symbols are a little elevated here. Yeah. They're like, and they're, his crashes on his left are not so close. They're, they're a little spread out a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. they don't hit each other. So that, so perhaps his ride symbol is a little higher than we had anticipated or, or to avoid. We well, they're learning and they're in the studio more and yeah. Martin, did they record there a lot? They did, uh, the classic albums at compass point. They did, okay. uh, this, but this was the last one they, they did uh, peace of mind, power slave somewhere in time in compass point. Um, only the drums were done on this album here though. Uh, they recorded the rest of it, I think in New York and okay. somewhere in Europe, but, um, they did go back in 2012 or was it 2010 for the final frontier album and they recorded nice. there one last time before they tore that studio down but back in black was recorded there i mean this oh, place man. was like what a place but it was old and so you know i yeah. guess it was outdated but i don't know the record they did there in 
the final frontier sounded great. So, I mean, I, that was the days of the destination recording studio where you go yeah. to the Bahamas and yeah, I'd love to do that. It's yeah. Awesome. Well, but it's also perfect for an English band to go there because the, the tax laws, <laughs> I think made the little, you know, a lot of the English bands didn't want to record in England because, uh, hmm. the taxes, yeah, there was, uh, a little more of an yep. incentive to, to not do yep. that. The English love their taxes, as, yeah. we, as we know in America. That's right. <laughs> so on this particular, uh, on the album, he used an LM402. But you know, on the tour, he was using the sonar version of the 402, which is the D506. Hmm. And I don't know if I have a good picture of that particular drum. Um because it was an all black version of that Pharaoh manganese uh, yeah. snare drum. And yeah. I believe it was mixed uh, on tour. I think he used the, the 402 on some dates and the 506 on other dates. Uh, he really loved his Ludwig snare drum. So I've got this picture up here. And from what I can see, it, it, it's, I can't really tell there which yeah. one he's using, but it looks like he's got a black color sound China over. That's pretty, it's cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. And the gong looks yeah, black. all black. And he's got, it's the introduction of the maiden font on a gong, right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, you've made it. Yeah. Your right. Font is your font is on a gong. Yeah, exactly. And it's, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, he, on the list that I have, uh, you know, we've got a definite mix up, uh, for symbols, the, he's using the 3000 series because uh, those replaced the 2002s, if I'm not mistaken, at that time. Uh, I would ask Dan Garza. Yeah, I, yeah like, Dan, <laughs> Dan is probably going, ah, ah, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> His fingers are on fire from typing right yeah, now. <laughs> I, yeah, he, he sure are. Um, but yeah, he was using Power Crashes on the left, 17, 19. Um, and he's got a 16 inch power crash and the rude, he moves over to the right, uh, a 20 inch, uh, but he's hmm. got, still got the bell ride and the bright ride and two of the color sound chinas, which provide a great visual I mean, in the back there. Oh yeah. yeah. Which helps sell symbols. And, uh, I'm sure Peisty loves that. Yes. So, you know, going back to the live after death video, I watched that, I, but I grew up in, you know, rural Maine. So there was nowhere for me to go see paste symbols. That's what I thought they were. <laughs> I, it, me too. Yeah. Everyone did. Or, or, or sonar drums. I mean, it was just, so this, it was like rocket ship, you know? Yes, exactly. A whole new world. And, and it's interesting. He, he really has the, the European brands kind of, well displayed yeah you know switzerland and germany yes and, uh, jaw sticks well the brand the band is you know very proud british band yes of course and a lot of them use the british equipment you know the marshall amps the obviously an exception being american guitars because they, they love their fenders yep uh, but nico obviously used premier drums for a while which were uh, british drums but yeah, I mean, when you think about the what we were talking about earlier with the drumsticks and the regions, Piesty was probably a more prominent brand uh, at the time. And but Piesty was also the rock symbols of those sure. of that era in the in the seventies when yeah, he yeah. was coming up. And again, this is really just testimony to Piesty symbols in, in that. Look, there's a lot of great symbol brands that make great sounding symbols, but could you imagine hearing? Iron Maiden or Led Zeppelin or Van Halen on Zildjian cymbals. I just can't conceive it. You know, it's, just, <laughs> it's, but there's something about not to get too existential, but like Zildjian is just almost kind of a Kleenex of cymbals where people just equate everything to be Zildjian. But mm -hmm. it's like maybe Peisty, we as drum nerds know that those guys are, you know, famous for their Peisties, but I don't think it's as common knowledge that Bonzo played Peisty, Alex Van Halen played Peisty as right. to, to Joe Schmo, a bass player, right. whoever. They just assume it's all Zildjian. Right. Um, but but no, it is iconic, that sound. Yeah. You make a, a good point. I, I think what, you, what uh, 
when you say Zildjian being like the Kleenex, everybody else yeah. is a derivative of that. Yeah. The way that they make a, a B20 bronze alloy symbol is all very similar. And huh. Paiste, the way they make their symbols is completely different. And so it has a completely different sound. Um, and this was at a time where, you know, recordings were hi-fi was so in and, you know, overhead mics love the frequencies of Paiste cymbals. Hmm. They just eat, they love them. And, and when you hear a rock band, it just adds all this top end sparkle to the sound of the kit. And nowadays, so, you know, the, the dark sound is in, and I think a lot of that is because everything is so isolated. Yeah. You, you know, the drum sounds, the drums can be recorded alone. And with Pro Tools, they can be separated by tracks. Completely. And, and so you can have this dark sound. But the problem is, is that there's a lot of thickness to that, that frequency. Less up top. Yeah, and, and it doesn't really give you that dynamic spread. So, yeah. you know, but that'll t- yeah. that's the fad now. And then in a few years, it'll go back to bright. Yeah. That's yeah. just what, yeah. what, it, what trends do, right? Do you personally play Peisty on your set? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I have Peisty's, but I also love Sabian symbols too. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think I, I mean, you have everything. I do have everything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, if you held a gun to my head and said, oh, okay, what, what are you going to play? It'd be Peisty. Yeah. I, I do. Okay. Love, I love their sound. Hopefully that never happens. Someone holds a gun to your head. Yeah. But yeah. You know, thanks. I, I hope not either. That, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. All right. Well, where do we go from uh, there? If that's everything with yeah number the, four there, the the next one. Tech. This this is where we're going to enter the white period, uh, where th- th- this this if there's anything that's going to be steeped in controversy, it's going to be the next few kits, um, because these are the three white kits in a row. Now. There's so much going. There's going to be so much about this one that uh, brought up a picture here. Now, this is so on the badges. This is a sonar, sonar signature. So I asked Nico about this kit, and he remembers this very, very clearly. They they recorded the seventh son of the seventh son album in Munich, and during the springtime, we have the Frankfurt Music Messe show which for those of you who don't know, was kind of like the NAM show, but it was even bigger than NAM. It was sure. in Frankfurt. So he had a rendering of what the stage setup was going to be. And he went to Frankfurt and brought it to the show to meet with Horst uh, Link. And when he got there, Horst was in a meeting, but Horst's wife, uh, Elizabeth, was there. And he was talking to her, and out of the corner of his eye, he noticed their performer series kit on display in a color that he called uh, white, uh, an ice white. Now, in their catalog, they didn't call it that, but I know what he was getting at. It was really a, a white, very bright white drum set. And he saw that and he said, oh my God, I love that finish. What if we did that with some uh, prismatic sparkles, some light sparkles? And so uh, he was telling that to Elizabeth, and she's nodding her head. Horse gets out of his meeting, and Elizabeth goes over and talks to Horse about it. And Nico says, all he could hear is, nine, 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 nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not referring to nine toms. <laughs> no, 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 no. The answer is no. <laughs> Yeah, the not, no. We're not because because what he wanted was the phonics with that finish. Yeah, and Horst was not gonna have that. Um, and you know, and I'm sure there's many reasons. It could be a, a how do you tell your team to make? Because again, remember this is bef- this was before drums were custom shops. Yeah. You know, drum companies were, this is what they made. This is what they offered. They weren't set up to be customized. Obviously, that all changed a few years later. But back then, it, was, it just wasn't as easy to do that. No. So, Horst finally gives it more thought. And he said, I will give you your nine-ply beach shell. Because the signatures were 12-ply beach. The phonics were nine-ply beach. Hmm. He said, I'll give you your, your nine-ply beach phonics shell. Uh, but it has to have a signature badge on it. And so 
in his Rhythms of the Beast video, he talks about his kit and he even says, this is, this is 12 ply birch. But it wasn't. He was, they made the compromise. Yes. It was, this is actually a beach kit. Hmm. Now the other real stick in point on this one is the depths of the toms. Nico, he thinks that these were square. He remembers them being square. Something I found that was interesting was in, this is the same time that Sonar offered the signature light series, which was a 12 ply, but thinner ply and power depths. They weren't square because the signature series were always square, but the signature light was 10 by 9, 12 by 11, 13 by 12, 14 by 13, 16 by 14, and 18 by 18 floor toms. And I can tell you as a guy who's worked in drum stores for 25 years and seen all drums, these are not square size toms. And a lot of people seem to recall them being square I'm telling you, these are not square drums. They're big toms, so maybe it gives the illusion of squaring them up kind of in your mind. You know, I sure. see where they're coming from. but Sure, yeah. but I'm going to bring up a couple of other pictures here that sort of seal the deal. And you can see the difference in this picture, which is a black and white picture, but you can see the difference in, in spread between the toms and the bass drum. You know what I mean? It, it looks yeah. it looks like he, your drum his drum set's wearing a belly shirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's because there's one inch missing there. Yeah. And so he may not have known that that it wasn't even in square because you know by the time he got the kit for the tour, it was just set up and, and set it up. Yeah, and he's not measuring. Yeah, right. I mean, but but I'm sure he would have known it then, but he may not have remembered. Uh, yeah. ab about this, uh, bringing up another picture uh, here that that really sort of illustrate the the depths. Um, and this is, I mean, so I, I'm very partial to white drum kits because I love the way lights hit them. You, you know? Yeah, it's awesome looking. And the the Seven Sun stage set was very uh, like Antarctica almost, and and so this was a very fitting yeah, look. White color sound chinas in the back yes. are cool. Yeah. That yeah. that really is the topper for me is the white symbols. Yeah. You don't see that very often. No. No. I, I think those are gorgeous. And he had two uh, two of those chinas, as you can see. And, yeah. Uh, the um, clip-on on that photo you have up, the clip-on mic stand things, the, the mounts... That kind of takes me back to using some of those every once in a while, and that that was an interesting period of time where where that was the mic yes situation kind of uh not the best not the best setup right. for mics. It's interesting that you bring this up because LP introduced the claw around this time, hmm. and if I'm looking at that, that does not look like an LP claw. It looks like somebody else's, you know prototype of it perhaps yeah, i don't know their version of it but yeah oh god they just look so ugly on toms don't they and they just kind of they never grip enough no, on the bottom no and... yeah we we're, again we're so spoiled now <laughs> with, <laughs> with the gear that we have yeah do we have chimes i'm looking at your list here is there chimes on this kit is that oh symphonic gong chimes yeah so yes he did it it, it is listed that he's he's got his 40 in symphonic gong, and then he has those chimes. And those chimes probably were listed on the other ones, but th th that was definitely on the um, Power Slave kit as well, because that he used those for uh, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see him in a picture here. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. That's cool. That's kind of a little Neil, Neil is yes. to get more into that yeah. uh, symphonic world. Right. Well, again, back then you don't roll a tape to, to if you want to like just have a track or you, you don't you don't have a MacBook with Pro Tools yeah. to put drop the sample in. You actually no, have to no. get the hammer and hit that chime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's a kind of a big part of the intro to that song. So, yeah, he he must he's got those throughout the whole career. Probably the same set for all I know. Yeah, but this kit um, was featured in the Made in England video and the Rhythms of the Beast uh, video. 
Um, and th this one is actually gets this of all the kits, this sort of gets slagged on uh, because this was the kit that was used to record the follow up album, uh, No Prayer for the Dying. And that kit was actually recorded in Steve's barn using the Rolling Stones mobile unit uh, because the band had sort of um, hit their peak of grandiosity with the seventh son of a seventh son album and tour cycle. They wanted to get back to the beginning and go to a simple stage set and record in the barn. And Adrian Smith had left the band and Yannick Gers comes in. They want to just kind of reconnect to their roots. And so it was kind of a lo-fi affair in terms of recording. And a lot of people slag on the drum sound for that. And I believe that the drum, I think the drums sound good on that. I, I, I like it. I'm sure they're great. I got to re-listen to that, yeah. but I'm sure they're, yeah. But he's using sonar heads. This is where he left Ludwig heads and went to sonar heads. Because for a while, sonar was making drum heads. An interesting little tidbit, you know, Remo, obviously, they had the majority of the market share in the 1980s. And they supply most of the drum companies with their drum heads. They still do. But in the late 80s, Remo was like, hey, why don't we start making drums? Well, yeah. Horse Flink wasn't too thrilled about that because one of my suppliers is now becoming my competitor. Yeah, and, that's tough. And so, you know, he's like, well, Sonar started as a drum head manufacturing company uh, in the 1800s. And so mm. they said, let's do this again. Sort of like Rogers. Yeah. I think that was how they started too. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were tannery, right? Tannery, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they decided they were going to make their own plastic heads and they used the same mylar that remote used. And, you know, something that they learned the hard way is that you can use the same materials, but that doesn't mean it's going to sound the same. No. And I was watching the made in England video yesterday and he's using the, the, the no, I'm the rhythms of the beast video actually. And, and I could just hear the difference. I'm like, ah, oh, I want to hear the Remo heads <laughs> or I want to hear the, the Ludwig <laughs> You know, silver dot. Ludwig. Yeah. Yeah. Which Ludwig heads, I know I have an episode. I was kind of trying to quickly look that talks about that, but a lot of people loved those Ludwig heads. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it's they, funny. They, I'm famous. People know me as a guy who cramps all over those coated Weathermaster heads. I always say, when you buy a Ludwig snare drum, you need to get new heads. I have totally done an about face with this. Because I actually love the way Ludwig snare heads sound. Yeah. You know, they don't hold their coding well, they don't stay in tune as well, but they have a sound. Yeah. 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 Especially the very, very I mean, Ludwig, um, but did they stop they stopped producing drum heads at some point, correct? Recently, yes, because they invented that method of manufacturing those drum heads in nineteen fifty five at Ludwig. Oh. And they used the same machines that whole time. They never evolved. <laughs> they made drum heads the way, same way all that time. And the amount wow. of space those machines took up in the factory, it was in insane. I mean, and there was so much square footage being used and they were losing money on every drum head they sold. Yeah. So yeah. eventually they said, we're going to have to stop this, but they still make their snare heads uh, because um, a lot of the schools, when they resubmit their purchase orders every year, they use the same part numbers, and so they still make that snare head. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's enough to, I'm sure that's enough for the business to keep that part. Yes, yeah. Way. And so I don't know what they did with the machines. They're, they're gone, I, I think. But, but uh, yeah, it's a shame. Another episode. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah, he used the sonar heads for a while, and, and uh, he recorded that album with an LM402. But on the tour, he went to an all-white D506. And when I say That's all cool. white, it's a painted white with chrome hardware. Yeah. And so that particular snare drum is a fantastic sounding snare drum. I actually have one of these and I love it. I, I bet that he did not like this one as much because, you know, putting paint on a metal shell is almost like putting a sweater on it. Kills the resonance. It, it just dries it up a little bit. Yeah. And so huh. it must look cool. Uh, but and, and everything that I'm saying is theory. Like, I, I don't know that for sure, but I, I mean, I, I doubt this one would sound as good as just the chrome plated one. Uh, but obviously, yeah. he used the 402 and this back and forth. So who knows which one got more stand time? Yeah, 
Yeah, really. And your your list here says uh, maybe DW on the bass pedal. So I've I've concluded that he was using the Speed King at this okay at this point, but it was on the next one. Or, or we're, we're, actually, we're going to get there in a minute uh, where we get into the DW. Gotcha. Here's a, a cool picture of him. And, and when I was talking to you about the peak of their grandiosity, uh, if the gong and his outfit doesn't suggest that enough, <laughs> yeah. you know, this We've, is spandex has entered the picture yeah, with this uh, is, custom embroidery. Yes. Uh, this is really, um, you know, the, the, the stage production was at that peak. And, oh, it's and, awesome. And uh, the presentation was there. but And he likes to play barefoot, but he's using wrestling boots or boxing boots as you can see at that point mm. um but it, you know notice the snare mic is white on this as well wow yeah that's attention to detail yeah and he's using sonar heads uh the bat the ebony heads there and this is where we start to get into a little bit of strangeness because none of us experts and even nico himself can't remember how many white kits there were meaning versions of this yes. drum set for like the road and things. right yeah. so if you look to his right if you look at his 16 inch concert tom uh mounted tom over there yeah it looks dark on the inside doesn't it yeah yeah now that could be because it has a babinga interior where it's you know horse wanted to have that signature light shell because that's what they were doing or it could be a reflection of the black ebony bottom head. We're not sure. So we can't identify like a hundred percent what the interiors of these shells look like. Okay. So when we get into the neck, here's a very uh, small resolution picture. And this is from the next tour, the no prayer for the dying tour. And he's got a white kit. And if you look at that picture, you see his floor tom off to his mounted tom off to the right. That is definitely a Bubinga interior. Yeah. And it's a thicker ply. Yeah. This is definitely a thicker ply shell than the one I showed you in the previous picture. Meaning there's multiple kits, multiple or variations of the same exactly. white finish Ex- being used. Exactly. But it gets a little more confusing so i'm bringing up this picture this is from the no prayer for the dying tour the next tour after the seventh son of a seventh son kit and i'm looking at this picture those are square size toms without Mm. question yeah so this is a different kit this is definitely a different kit we just don't know which part of it is different we don't know is this a beach or is this the 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 beach or because the shell looks thicker in that earlier picture that I showed you. So we don't know. And and he, he was not a fan of the extra thick shell. So he was using this cast bronze snare drum, which is one of only two in the world. Wow. Why so few created? Well, this was again, the, uh, they made a 14 by 8 and a 14 by 4 cast bronze. HLD 590 is the name of the, the 14 by 8. And they didn't do a 6.5 for whatever reason. But they made two. And at the time, I think Nico thought there was only one because he may have been the first one. I think Bernard Purdy got the other one. Hmm. But this is a, a very uh, you know famous legendary snare drum with a copper hardware. Um, and he used it on this album tour cycle. So it's possible that he said, let's get the thicker shells, the signature series shells um, on this kit and use the cast bronze snare. Wow. But what we don't know is, did he use this kit to record that album? We just, we don't know. And there's so little out there, but yesterday I was doing some YouTubing in preparations for our conversation today. And I found a very high res video from Finland on that tour. And I've brought it up on this picture here. 
Yep. I wonder how many people are still listening to this at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. We're alone now. <laughs> it's just us. No, but these, they're out there. These are definitely heavy shells. If you look at this, those rack tongs, so they're definitely the 12 ply, thicker ply shells with Babinga interiors. So yeah, you can see the thickness. This there. is a signature heavy kit, white lacquer. So there's, there's no question about that. So as I had said before, Nico didn't re recall that there were three white kits, but then I'm going to bring up another piece of evidence here. And this is the fear of dark kit, the fear of the dark kit, which is the next album. And what do we notice here? The interiors on these shells are lighter. They're beach. So this yeah. is a regular, this is the phonic. This nine is nine ply. <clears throat> yes. This is the nine ply phonic. And so th this to me makes me conclude that there are three white kits. Would this be like one stays in Europe, one goes to America, one goes to wherever, yeah. you know, so floater. There, yeah. uh, there, there's B rigs, C rigs. I know that he did that with his premier kits. I'm not sure that he did that with Sonar because when they played overseas in Japan, Australia, um, which we'll get into later, he, it, at that point in time in their career, they were using backline kits mostly. Sure. So I don't Makes know. Sense. Yeah. I, I, and I, I believe they would freight it over uh, to America when they were playing America and then back uh, when it was going, you know, back to Europe. And that, that again, is my, my theory. I don't know that it's fact, yeah. Yeah. Um, but this allows me to conclude that there are three kits because this is, these are square sized tongs. Uh, but there is so much cool things in this picture that uh, Jim McCourt actually pointed this out to me. This, this picture is taken in 1992 possibly early 93 but he's using in-ear monitors there i my immediately was like god that seems early for any so th th these are some of the very first that were ever produced yeah because i know alex van halen also was early to in-ears yeah. as well but i was like man this can't be that early right wow yeah cool. and jim told me that yeah nico did not like them and, and he never he didn't didn't use them very long Back to headphones with a band around it. Kind of. Yeah. Well, no, just the, or in the studio. Yeah, it, alive. It was. He likes the wedge. Oh, just a monitor. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool, they, cool. they have. They've had the same stage set, uh, stage, you know, layout their whole career, where he is in this box, and he has this. He has his own PA system. <laughs> just <laughs> blasting. blasting. Him. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's how he likes it. Uh, and, and honestly, that's how I like it too. I mean, I, I just like that hear that kick drum, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, the other cool thing in this picture is if you look at that bass drum beater, if you can see it in that picture, that yep. is one of the early DW bass drum beaters. So this that is brown. Yeah, yeah. I've got one of those yeah. floating around with the double sided felt on one side, plastic on the other. The DW SM 101 is what that's called. Of course, yeah. yes. And that that is so that is really this is allows us to sort of date when that changeover happened from the Speed King to the DW pedal. It was like it was between eighty nine and ninety two. It was it was in that window. And it would be a five thousand. Yeah, it was a five thousand accelerator. And yeah. I went as far back I, I, I actually wanted to be as thorough as I possibly could and I contacted my friends at DW and I said when did Nico, you know, first to get DW pedals? And uh, my friend Andrew Meskin at DW got back to me and said, our first shipment to him was in 2003. So he was likely buying the, the bass drum pedals and hi-hat stands and didn't become an artist until, you know, on the endorser until 2003. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. It looks like here, if I'm looking at a logo kind of close, was he, was this a DW hi-hat pedal at this point or were they making one or is that still sonar they were but that was a, that's the sonar signature hi hat stand. yeah okay yeah okay Makes and this sense. is that stand is one of the best feeling hi-hat stands to this day uh todd suckerman still uses this on his kit he has all really? pearl drum set but he uses the sonar signature hi-hat stand because huh, that's cool yeah it was really just a great great feeling stand uh, but you know the pedal once he tried that dw He's he was just sold like the you know he preferred that much over the the Speed King. Yeah, I mean it's 
Yeah, I get it. I love I love the five thousand. I have one of those old earlier five thousands. So it's the single chain. Yes. And they are they're cool. They're great. I actually really prefer responsive. that. Yeah, yeah, I like. I it. prefer Made that. in the USA one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the double chain to me is a little little more sluggish. Uh, yeah. I like that that original five thousand. Yeah, but so we have concluded, we, and we sort of jumped around two or three kits here. Um, it's it, debatable, but it, you know, I believe it was two or three kits. But the symbols stayed relatively the same uh, throughout. We, you know, we've got the three thousand reflectors. Um, we've got the sound creation. We've got the uh, the sound creation bell ride and the bright ride. But some big changes were really about to, to happen. Hmm. Um, big changes were, were on the horizon uh, because this was his last sonar kit. Wow. Yeah. And, and so Nico's a very loyal guy and he loved sonar, but sonar was going through a lot at this time. Uh, they were going through, uh, Horselink had sold the company in 91. That's when they went under contract. So I don't know if that actually went through where Honer took over in 1992. And so when, you know, that happens, then, you know, certain things like artist support kind of take a back seat, right? Sure. <laughs> so they were uh, in New Zealand and uh, he was telling this story and he's still upset about it. <laughs> it's 1992. He told me the artist relations guy's name. Wow. Who I, 30, won't, yeah, I won't say. Yeah, 30 years later. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, you know, so... He had a, he had asked Carl Hines, uh, you know, have a kit there in in New Zealand for me, uh, and one in Australia in his color. And so, a lot of times when things like when, when bands do that, they'll send it. The, the drum company will send it to their distributor. The band will use it. Then it goes to a dealer. The drum shop will buy the drum kit, and they'll set it up in their shop showroom. And then somebody will come in and buy it. And that's how a lot of yeah. That works. Do they label it played by Nico McBride? That's up to the shop. I would. Yeah. You know, that's I would, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and I've had a few of those kits over the years. Um, and um, so, so Sonar did not send him, they, they sent him a Force 3000 kit, which was their budget model kit. It was still a very nice made in Germany drum set, but it's not Nico's kit. It wasn't square sizes, and it was only 10, 12, 13, 14, 16 floor tom and a 22-inch bass drum. So he was not happy about that at all. And then, you know, during the end of the gig, uh, you know, he steps up and stands on the drum stool with one foot and on the floor tom with his other foot, and the floor tom, like, bent, gave out, and he went mm. ass over tea yeah. kettle and wiped out right at the end of how it would be their name. So. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he wound up throwing the floor top up into the lighting truss out of a fit of anger. and It almost hit Bruce, and then Bruce threw the floor top back at him. <laughs> Poor floor And top. that was the end of Sonar. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. And that was – Bad night. Yeah. That was it. And, and, and I looked at their tour, day, tour dates. That kit, That tour was in two different legs. They had nine more dates on that tour. And they were uh, in Australia and Japan. And so he played those gigs. And I wound up finding some bootlegs in Japan. And he's using a backline kit for those gigs. Uh, it's a Sonar Babenga signature series. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was the end. After, after that, for the second leg of the tour, that's when we get into the premieres. That's pretty rough. I mean, he just clearly didn't get the support yep. he needed. But on, you know... Sonar's defense, the whole company was changing. There's so many different artists. They couldn't prioritize, couldn't make it happen. And New Zealand is like a world away. Yeah, basically. there's no defense for Sonar at that point. And I'm not going to throw Sonar. It's, it's, it's the people at the company. And it wasn't Carl. It was this other guy that he isolated. And I see this all the time. You know, with, with, there's people out there. that They just, they're, they're lazy. They don't do their yeah. job. And, yeah. and uh, you know, there's a lot of on the line when you're a band at that level, when you're playing to as many people that are buying tickets, it's a, a real serious thing. And yeah. so, you know, Nico might look like he's having a laugh up there, but this is something he takes very seriously. Oh my God. Right? Sure. 
So, you know, it wasn't funny to him and it's still not funny. And I wouldn't, yeah, I'd be angry too. So that was the end. And he was very diplomatic after he left. He's like, well, they were a family run company and I wanted to deal with a family run company. He didn't mention that incident. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, you don't want to, uh, but again, he seems like he's not going to harp on it or be, He's clearly unhappy, but he seems like such a nice guy that it'd be like, listen, all right, we're just done. Yeah. I'm, I'm moving on. Yeah. Okay. So Shane and I have uh, just discussed, and I think per usual with these episodes, you got to come to kind of a point where you stop with part one and we're going to pick up part two. Switching to premiere seems like a pretty clear point to let's pause here. And then in part two of this series, um, we'll pick it up there because he was with premiere then for seven or eight kits oh, yeah. like on your yeah. list a while many years many years of premiere yeah, yeah which feels right yep british brand and uh they're all about the british uh pride yeah. so um shane as we wrap up here why don't you tell everyone where they can find you um your youtube channel is amazing everything ev- everything you guys do is just top notch oh, and you. kind of i think uh, a um a benchmark for the whole industry yeah. of what, what a shop can be. So, That's so nice. yeah, direct people to all your socials and everything. Yeah. So, uh, I have a, the drum center of Portsmouth. We're in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We're the largest drum store in the world. We've got a huge showrooms, 20,000 square feet of nothing but drums. I don't do guitars. I don't do PA <laughs> systems. Well, maybe a couple. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we have a YouTube channel, uh, drum center NH, if you just plug in Drum Center NH into your Google box, you're going to find everything you need. We're on the web at drumcenter.com. Yeah, that's us. Yeah, that's perfect. I hope to check it out in person someday. I don't, I don't get out to those parts very often, uh, being in Cincinnati, but I'm very, very eager someday to visit and check out the shop. Yeah. And, uh, well, you have your hands full right now. But when, yes. when you, uh, maybe you'll take a family <laughs> vacation and you'll come up and see us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're old enough to literally <laughs> sit up, then I think we can start to uh, think about family yeah. vacations like that. But um, so I want to just tell you how much I appreciate, and I'm sure for everyone watching this, the amount of work you have put in. I can tell how your brain works, <laughs> yeah. and clearly leads to why your you know business is so successful because you're very organized and uh, and. It's it's a labor of love to do this for you. Maybe it's good publicity for the drum shop, and I hope people go to your website and your socials. But really, this is just for fun and yeah. uh, a definite labor of love. So um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, yeah. and and to like you said to Nico too for helping and yeah. everyone who's contributed. It's a dream come true to have him even oh, know that I exist. With, yeah, so. right. Without a doubt. I, I mean, it's. But this is uh, like I'm not doing this to promote my store at all. It's really this this appeases the kid in me and it's also my contribution to 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 nico himself and to the to the fans out there of the band i mean it's just yeah it's just so cool and obviously you've done such a great job collating these people uh into one group that can do these kinds of podcasts and and uh yeah, i think i stand in good part. company with the people you've had on the, the tony williams <laughs> i mean come on it was, that was great yeah yeah, I appreciate that because I need to, I try to be selective. I mean, I straight up tell people who were I'm kind of on the you it was a no brainer yeah. of, of yes, but but some people who are like I want to do this. I'm like, you really need to know every nut and bolt. Yep. I, I don't. You do because people are going to absolutely rip you apart in the comments <laughs> if you don't. And I don't want to put something out that is like oh a little bit of a. Yeah. You know, we we talk about a little bit here and there. It's like no, this is absolutely two or three part. Right. You know, nerd fest. Yep. Um, so, but we have a lot to look forward to. So we're yeah. going to get into the premiere kits next time. Uh, we're going to get, I can't wait to hear more about the drum, the different unique finishes that yeah. he gets into and all that yeah. stuff. Um, so we will pick it up next time with part two. We'll jump into the premiere kits and, uh, and go from there. So Sounds Shane, great. thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to part two. Yeah. Thank you.